Thank and welcome. You. Thanks so much, Barbara um, and Peter. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you today, especially having my husband with me. Um, and uh, he refers to himself jokingly as the nearly extinguished professor, and you're going to learn why soon. Um, so just a, a few disclaimers first. Um, my husband and I actually hold stock in a phage company. We're not going to be speaking about any specific companies today. I'm an unpaid advisor to another phage company. All patient photos today are used with permission. Um, my husband is most of those patients. And um, our land attribution is that um, we're speaking from Kumeye unceded land. So our story really began in 2015 when we were on holiday in Egypt. Tom had always wanted to see the Valley of the Kings and uh, there had just been a terrorist attack in Sharm El Sheikh and um, all Westerners that were supposed to be on the cruise ship that we were um, going to be on canceled. And Tom said, no, this is the perfect time to go. There'll be nobody uh, around, no crowds. He was absolutely right. You can see us at some of these um, wonderful sites and um, we had them all to ourselves. In fact, on the right hand side, he's crawling backwards down into the red pyramid outside of Cairo. Um, 300 feet down in the dark. I was a little too timid to do that. Um, so you would think that he was in perfect health. He certainly looked to be in, in good health. He was definitely overweight. He's six foot five and he was pushing 300, 300 pounds at the time. But there was nothing to indicate that there was anything wrong until after we'd had this lovely meal on top of the cruise ship. It was supposed to be our last night and we were supposed to see the Valley of the Kings the next day and he got violently ill. Now, I just assumed that he had food poisoning, which is pretty common when you go um, to Egypt. But, um, you know, he got increasingly um, weak and couldn't keep anything down. And um, we had to get him um, sent to a local clinic. There was no hospital in Luxor where the ship was based. Um, they diagnosed him with pancreatitis, which is an inflammation of the pancreas. Um, and it wasn't until later that we found that this was due to a gallstone that had blocked his bile duct and caused a small abscess to form. It was about the size of a grapefruit. And um, you'll see on the left here, he's being pushed into a CT clinic, uh, T CT scanner. And on the right is after we were first met back to Germany. He was too weak to be sent back home. Um, and now we're in full PPE. Um, this was, of course, before covid um, and I didn't even know what the acronym for PPE was, uh, but we all do now. Um, and um, I thought that this was just a precaution. They had us in the ICU um, and, um, you know, they said, look, he's coming from Egypt. We're not sure what's going on. Um, and this is to protect other patients. Um, so um, what happened next was that uh, they did an endoscopy and they took out this bile, um, this gallstone. And I figured that that solved the problem. They said, well, not so fast. You know, um, there's something worse going on. And the doctor showed me this flask that had this brown putrid fluid in it and said this was the fluid inside this abscess. If that abscess had just formed, it would have been clear fluid. But because it's um, putrid like this, there's something growing in it. Well, it turns out that something was Acinetobacter bomanii which is a really deadly superbug. And by superbug, I mean, um, this is a bacteria that has acquired resistance to multiple antibiotics. Um, and the World Health Organization keeps a list of the most serious superbugs that are, are cause um, threat to human health. And this one is actually on the top of the list. Um, surprisingly, this is an organism I used to plate on my Petri dishes back when I was at the University of Toronto as an undergrad student in the 1980s. And we considered it to be a really wimpy organism back then. All I needed was a lab coat and gloves, and that was it. Um, and um, yet over the last several decades, this organism has acquired superpowers. It's um, really good at stealing antimicrobial resistance genes from other bacteria. Um, it can stick to hospital linens, even body lice, and it's um, almost always associated with multidrug resistance. And just for those of you that are um, interested in medical history, this organism has the unfortunate nickname of Arachobacter because so many uh, veterans in the Middle East um, acquired it um, when they were exposed to um, IEDs or other kinds of bomb blasts. And 
when they were medevaced home um, to be cared for, unfortunately, Asanita Bacter Bomania came with them. And so many of these troops survived their bomb blast, but actually died from this superbug. And nowadays, this organism is most often acquired in hospital settings in Western Europe and the US. Um, other, And it's still ubiquitous in the Middle East. So this is when I started to get a little worried. Um, and the doctor said, look, we have to do what's called an antibiogram, which is an antibiotic susceptibility profile. And so we were still in Germany at this point, And this antibiogram came back several days later because it had to be outsourced. You don't need to understand German to um, um, look at this and realize that there's a problem. Every um, one of those R's in this chart, um, it stands for resistance. So um, this organism was resistant to 15 different antibiotics right off the top and was only partially sensitive to three. And um, I call those the gorilla cillins because they have to be infused into the patient and they have a lot of side effects um, such as colistin, which is the last resort antibiotic that was developed in World War II. Now, around this time, I started to brush up on the superbug crisis and I was pretty shocked that um, it was a lot worse than I thought. Um, by 2050, one person every three seconds or 10 million people per year are estimated to die uh, from a superbug infection at a, an annual cost of $100 trillion to the global economy. And um, the situation is one that has actually gotten worse under COVID. Um, but right the year before COVID hit, the um, Global Burden of Disease Program uh, out of the University of Washington made the first estimates of the number of people that were currently dying of superbugs and found that it was about 5 million already. And that's more than HIV, TB, or malaria. And um, how did we really get into this mess? Well, it isn't um, so much the misuse of, of antibiotics in medicine. About 70% of antibiotics used in the US and Canada and many countries are actually used in agriculture and animal husbandry. You know, uh, an antibiotics are literally fed to pigs and cows and chickens. Um, and they were used as growth promoters for many years, um, and they still are. There's, are it's, they're banned as growth promoters, but there's lots of loopholes that allow them to be used this way, and an agribusiness lobby that that um, ensures that these antibiotics are still being um, used um, in this industry. In fact, um, streptomycin, which is a medically important antibiotic, um, millions of pounds of streptomycin are still sprayed on citrus trees here in California and in Florida. And when you're using the same antibiotics in, um, you know, agriculture, as you are in humans, um, you're going to breed resistance. So this problem um, is, is global. In fact, the year, the month and the year that Tom fell sick, the uh, paper um, came uh, to be published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, and this was the first report of, re of a, a resistance gene um, against colistin, and that's the antibiotic that, that was one of the last few that Tom was initially sensitive to, or his bacterial isolate was sensitive to. Now, this paper, when it was published, it cast a pall through the whole infectious disease community because, again, this antibiotic, as lousy as it is, it was is the last resort antibiotic and um, China at the time was still feeding colistin to pigs and so this MCR1 gene as it's known um, people thought that it had just came on the scene but turns out subsequent studies showed that it was already in 30 countries so it was no surprise that Tom's bacterial isolate actually had this gene and that was a shock to um, some of the doctors initially um, but it just goes to show you how poor our global surveillance is of antimicrobial resistance and how behind we are. Um, and now, unfortunately, even though colistin is no longer um, used as a growth promoter in China, they still export it to lower and middle income countries such as Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Nigeria. So this problem is, is not going away. Now, I also wanted to make sure you realize that this isn't a problem that's just over there. Uh, in fact, this MCR1 gene was reported for the first time in wastewater in LA County um, just um, last year. So um, now we're watching for it um, everywhere.
Um, so back to our story, um, this picture was taken um, after Tom was medevaced back home to San Diego. Um, he was um, in the Thornton Hospital. It was prior to the Jacobs Hospital um, that was um, er erected right beside the Thornton Hospital. And, um, you know, the doctors repeated the antibiogram and found that his organism had acquired resistance to the last remaining antibiotics. So it was now considered pan resistant. And so he was too weak for surgery and they worried that if they operated to take this abscess out, that um, this organism could get into his bloodstream and that he would go undergo septic shock and would die. So what they decided to do was put these um, catheters or tubes into his abdomen to try to siphon off all the infected fluid. And that was working for a time. Um, in fact, it looked like he was gonna get out of the hospital um, until one day he sat up in bed and one of those internal drains um, slipped and it poured all that infected fluid into his abdomen, into his bloodstream. He went into septic shock right in front of my eyes. Um, and I don't know if, if any of you have ever seen this kind of thing, but it's pretty scary. Um, when someone undergoes septic shock, their blood pressure drops, their heart rate increases. They um, usually have um, a lot of fluid that's leaving their body through sweat or urine or both. And, um, and then they often get rigors, the shakes. And Tom shook so hard that um, the bed frame hit the wall. And luckily a doctor and nurse were right there when this happened. They rushed him back into the ICU because he'd been on a regular ward. They put him in a medically induced coma and they hoped that he would come out of it. Eventually, about a week later, he did. But the bad news was, is that now this organism was everywhere. It was not just in his abdomen anymore. It was in his bloodstream. It was in his sputum. So he was fully colonized and there was no antibiotic anywhere that could touch it. So um, literally he was dying a little bit each day and it was absolutely terrible to watch. He'd lost over a hundred pounds and um, this photo was taken after um, the doctors told me that he wasn't going to make it. Um, as far as they could tell. And they asked me if I wanted to start kidney dialysis. Well, at the time, you can see he's already on a trach vent. So he was on a ventilator because his lungs were failing. He was on three different medications or pressors to keep his heart pumping. And I knew that by asking me if I wanted to start kidney dialysis, um, that they were asking, did I want to undergo, you know, heroic efforts to sustain his life? Well, um, I didn't want to make this decision for him. Um, but at the time he was in a coma and I hoped that maybe he could hear me. And so I asked him to squeeze my hand if he wanted to live. And I told him that I wanted to grow old with him, but if he, if was, he wanted to give up, he'd been in the hospital four months by this time. And, um, it was, he was in a lot of pain. I knew, but he did squeeze my hand. It took about a minute and, um, it, you know, I was very excited, but then I realized, oh crap, like, what am I going to do? I'm not a medical doctor. Um, we have some of the best infectious disease doctors in the world here at UC San Diego. And if they can't, you know, find a solution, then what can I do? But I knew that if if um, he was going to die, that I wanted to have left no stone unturned so that I gave it my best shot. So I did what anybody would do. I went home and I hit the internet and I used the National Library of Medicine search engine, PubMed, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And buried in um, an article, I found something called bacteriophage therapy or phage therapy for short. And that rang a bell. Um, and I knew um, that these phage are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria because I have this rusty old degree in microbiology. Um, but I never knew that they had been used to treat um, bacterial infections in, in people or animals. But as I started to delve into this literature late one night, um, I realized that they'd actually um, been um, seen in some way um, as far back as 1896. Um, and this fellow, um, Ernest Hankin, he was a, um, a bacteriologist who was based in India at the time. And he'd heard that the Ganges and Gemina rivers were holy and that they had sacred water that could kill bacteria. And he thought that that was very interesting because he noticed that downstream from where this um, this slum was and uh, where also the Hindu crematorium was, where bodies were 
being thrown into the water after they'd been burned, that downstream at this slum, that, that there was less cholera than there was upstream. And he thought that there should be more um, because he would think that the slum um, inhabitants would be more exposed to, um, to cholera. So what he decided to do was collect the water from this river and he got as close to the bodies as he could. And he had a very colorful description of all this. And he got the, this water and he passed it through a pasteur filter which is essentially a porcelain filter that um, screens out bacteria. And the filtrate, he um, put that on a, a Petri dish that was streaked with cholera bacteria and it killed the bacteria. So he didn't quite know what he was looking at, but he deduced that there was some kind of bacteriolytic agent that was in the water. And he chastised his colleagues back in England for um, looking down on the Indians for um, their beliefs about the water. And he said that the water was safer than the Thames, which at the time it was because um, they were throwing a lot of sewage into the Thames River. But anyway, uh, that's an aside. Um, on the right-hand side here is uh, Felix de Harel. He is lauded with actually being the discoverer of what is now called bacteriophage. He repeated the same kind of experiments that um, Hankin had done, but um, he deduced that what this agent was must be a parasite of the virus of bacteria because it was smaller than bacteria and killed bacteria. So he um, he called it bacteriophage, derived from the Greek meaning bacteria eater or bacteria devourer, and. He um, became quite famous, treated some children with um, uh, bacterial dysentery in uh, Paris in 1919 and helped establish uh, the first phage therapy center in what is now Tbilisi, Georgia. Now therein uh, lies the rub because um, this center um, was erected in uh, what was then the former was, was then Russia. Uh, it's now the former Soviet Union. And this was right uh, bumping up against the beginning of World War II. You'll see Eliava is um, um, the fellow who um, started the center and a much older Felix de Harel on the right. Um, is shown. And so this treatment got the reputation of being Soviet science or Soviet medicine done by the enemy. And that was one of the main reasons why phage therapy fell out of favor in the West, because it, it was being used in the 1920s and 30s. Of course, the other thing that happened is that penicillin came on the scene. It was ushered um, into the field um, to help the troops who were dying of of um, you know diseases that could be cured with penicillin, and um, it was brought to market in the 1940s. So um, the beauty of penicillin and 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 these broad spectrum antibiotics is that you didn't even need to diagnose the patient. You could just give them this penicillin, and it would it would kill practically anything that it was ailing them, if it was a bacteria. And of course, we know now that that kind of scorched earth approach is not um, healthy because if you're killing the friendly bacteria in the microbiome, then you're putting um, people at risk for other health problems. So um, anyway, phage was forgotten as a therapeutic in the West, but it continues to be used to this day in what is now the Republic of Georgia and in Poland, but not in the West. So I was reading up on all of this literature um, and I thought, you know, it would be really cool if we could use this to treat Tom. So I'm going to tell you um, just briefly how phage um, operates. So essentially, um, this is a bacterium stained in orange. It's uh, magnified 100,000 times. And those alien spiders um, are the phages that are attaching to um, the bacterial cell wall through a, a receptor. And they drill into it and their genetic material, usually DNA, enters the bacterial cell and turns it into a phage manufacturing plant. And when given the kill signal, those baby phages burst out um, and they kill the bacterial cell and then they go on to attack other bacteria, but only if they have the receptor that they are matched to. That's why they don't hurt the friendly bacteria in the microbiome. 
So we know now that there's 10 million trillion trillion phages on the planet. That's like 10 to the power of 31. They come in all shapes and sizes. Um, so there's a couple of different um, um, electron micrograph drawings at the bottom there. Um, and they're found essentially wherever you find bacteria. So they're found in soil, water, 30 billion phages move in and out of our tissues every single day. It's just that we didn't really know they were there when we talked about the microbiome. Most people are talking about bacteria, not the phage, which are the gatekeepers that keep those bacterial numbers in check. So I thought, well, let's see if we can, you know, get this phage to try to, you know, cure Tom. Well, I approached Dr. Chip Schooley, who at the time was the head of infectious diseases here at UC San Diego. And he said, you know, if you can find some phage that are a match for Tom's bacterial isolate, I'll call the FDA and get permission to give it to him on a compassionate basis because it's experimental treatment. So that was the next, you know, uh, task because uh, this is not my field. I didn't know anything about this. I went back to the literature. I looked for researchers that were based in the U.S. because I figured they had to be close by if they were going to help. Um, and they, they were studying phage and, and possibly Acinetobacter bomanii. And right away, Dr. Ryland Young, a total stranger from Texas A&M, responded and said that he would turn his um, lab into a command center and look for phage to kill Tom's bacterial isolate. The people shown on the right hand side here are all people that put their lives on hold for weeks um, to try to find phage that would match Tom's bacterial isolate. And the woman in the necklace is a, was a PhD student at the time. She slept in the laboratory looking for phage that were a match for Tom. And she found for four that were a match. And they were actually sourced from barnyard waste and sewage. Um, I, I just was shaking my head at the time because I knew that you know these bacteriophage have co-evolved with bacteria for 4 billion years. And Tom, being a socio-evolutionary biologist, would just be amazed that we were going to try to treat him with this um, novel treatment. So um, after that, um, we had another um, series of people that offered help. One of them was Jean-Paul Prunet from the Royal Astrid Military Hospital. Um, he had had um, able many eye phages and offered to send them in a diplomatic pouch. Now, those phages actually weren't active against Tom's bacterial isolate, but the fact that this fellow um, who was um, in the military um, had offered to, to help convince the U.S. Navy to get on board um, because after um, Dr. Schooley contacted the FDA, the FDA said th that the U.S. military has actually been working on phage therapy research and maybe they would help. Well, they were very um, reticent to do so until they heard that the Belgians were um, you know, willing to help. Um, so um, so the Navy said, yes, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can help you out. And this was um, uh, Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton who looks like a dead ringer for Tom Cruise, if you ask me. Um, and he worked at the U.S. Navy Biological Defense Research Directorate, known as the BDRD. Now, why did these guys have a whole bunch of phages? Well, I didn't find this out until years later. Um, but turns out that um, in 2001, when there was um, a, a, a terrorist, a domestic terrorist scare where um, letters that were contaminated with anthrax were sent to members of Congress and other um, actors and political um, people, it was this lab that used phage that are specifically targeting anthrax to, to diagnose that, yes, these letters have been um, contaminated with anthrax spores. So that actually started their whole phage therapy program. They had about 100 phages that were active against Acinetobacter pulmonii since, I, as you'll remember, that I told you that so many veterans had been affected by that organism. Um, and um, um, Lieutenant Commander Hamilton asked the fellow on the right-hand side, Dr. Biswajit Biswas, who is affectionately known as the phage whisperer, to see if any of those phages would be a match for Tom's. And he found four phages that were a match. Well, by this time, you know, if we already knew that Texas had four phages, why did we need more? Well, the, the thought went at the time that we would want as many phages as possible because you want to have phages that are going to attack different receptors 
of the bacterium so that the bacterium has um, less opportunity to become resistant to the phages. And um, we didn't have time to sequence any of these phages. So we didn't know um, how similar or different they were from one another, but it was great that we had two phage cocktails within three weeks of my uh, first cry for help. So um, where do these phages come from? So let me show you how this whole thing works just so that you have a better understanding. This kind of experiment is actually done in high schools and in undergraduate freshman uh, microbiology classes. Here's a flask of sewage. Um, and a Petri dish that this one's streaked with Acinetobacter bomanii. If you want to see that if there's any phage in that sewage that is a match for this organism, you put a few drops um, from that flask on this Petri dish and you incubate it for 24 to 48 hours. And if it comes back looking a bit like Swiss cheese, even though the phage are a hundred times smaller than the bacteria, um, you can see that, and, and you can't see them with the naked eye, you can see that they've been at work because they've gobbled up those bacterial colonies and the holes that they've made in the Petri plate are an indicative that you have a phage match. So you get excited, you can use a pipette to plug out those plaques and you add more bacteria in suspension and you let the nature do its work. Um, the bacteriophage attack the, the bacteria and the bacteria die and, um, and so on. And that cycle repeats. And so then you need to purify um, that preparation before you give it to a patient. So that's what they did. Essentially, um, this is uh, hasn't changed in a, in over a hundred years. The plaque assay, as it's known, um, but there were other um, uh, dilemmas. Um, the dosing dilemma. That's Doctor Schooley um, pictured in the middle. He had never done anything like this before. Um, um, in fact, nobody he knew had. Um, so he was grappling with how much phage do we administer to Tom? What routes of administration? How often? How long? He consulted. Dr. Maya Mirabashvili, who'd actually been trained at the Eliava Center in Georgia. And um, she said, well, we don't usually treat patients intravenously. Um, we go through like, you know, say the catheters in his abdomen or we treat them topically. Um, and um, and yet Carl Merrill, the a fellow on the right, he led an intramural uh, program at the NIH on, on phage and had always hoped that in his lifetime he would see a patient receive phage therapy and he convinced chip that because tom had a systemic infection he was fully colonized that he needed to be treated intravenously because if there was a hidden reservoir of bacteria that those phage didn't reach that the bacteria would become um, resistant to the phage very quickly so chip turned to me after he'd worked out um, all of that potential answers to to these questions and said, um, will you agree to treat Tom intravenously? And I said, yeah, you know, like Tom would want to go full tilt on this. So um, we had another problem at the very last minute. The Texas team had already sent their phage preps um, to us in San Diego. They were ready before the Navy's phage. And um, then they, they had to do this assay to measure the endotoxin. Endotoxin is, is essentially the lipopolysaccharide layer of the bacterial cell wall that is the debris that when those bacteria die because they've been attacked by phage, they um, that debris ends up in the preparation. And you need to remove as much of it as you can because it can be a toxin to the, the, the uh, patient. And so um, the Texas team did the endotoxin assays after they'd already shipped the preparation to us because Tom was just hanging on by a thread and the um, endotoxin levels were through the roof. Luckily, there was a team at San Diego State University that was studying phage um, in coral reefs, mm -hmm. and they had a whole setup that was the, able to be repurposed to purify the phage preparation for Tom. So the, the fellow at the bottom, Jeremy Barr, was a postdoc in the lab of Dr. Segal and Dr. Rauer, and he worked all weekend long um, to do this, and luckily it worked, and we had FDA approval, um, and here was the phage preparation. Um, it was green lighted on March 15th of 2016. So Tom had been in the hospital since, you know, early December. 
And um, the dose that was agreed upon was 10 to the 9 PFU per mil every two hours. So that's essentially 1 billion phages per dose. So if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what would. Um, and um, this is what Tom looked like the day that we started phage therapy. He was not squeezing anybody's hand or wiggling his eyebrows anymore. He was in a deep coma that he was not um, uh, waking out of. And um, his uh, we, we signed that consent form for kidney dialysis the day that we started phage therapy. Um, but you know what? We didn't need it because three days later after the phage therapy began, Tom woke up, lifted his head off the pillow and kissed his daughter's hand. She was on shift um, when he woke up and everybody in the ICU cooped and hollered. Nobody could believe it. It was just a miraculous day. Um, he had a very long recovery. Um, we can talk about that if you if you are interested in the gory details. Um, he left the hospital finally in August of 2016. And um, he's a much skinnier guy, um, even now. Um, at his, he began a long recovery. Um, and um, he'll you'll be able to see for yourself in a minute how well he's doing. Now, I want to show you another electron micrograph. This is actually Tom's bacterial isolate stained in blue being attacked by the Navy phages that are stained in green. Um, the Department of Homeland Security actually generated this micrograph. And I liked it so much that it's in um, the book um, in our paperback and hard copy in the middle. So it's, uh, it's pretty wild. Um, and so after... Um, um, Tom recovered, other patients started to receive therapy, phage therapy, um, based on the protocol that we used for Tom. And his case was presented at the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the bacteriophage um, in um, April of 2017, so a, a year after Tom was, was cured. And the, it, he got a standing ovation and, and the, it was Dr. Biswas who presented it. Um, and after that, we started to get calls from people all over the world. Um, the story went viral, but in a good way. And um, so we were in Time Magazine, we were on the Today Show, in People Magazine, Huffington Post, Mother Jones, the Economist, um, and then top medical journals that had actually passed on publishing the protocol. All of a sudden, we're very interested in this. So JAMA published a Q&A with Dr. Schooley that they've reprised um, again recently with a podcast. The Lancet commissioned a commentary on phage therapy. Um, and so it's, um, and most recently we were featured on CNN. So um, it's really been crazy. Um, we get so many requests, um, almost 2000 um, since um, um, we've started to do this in earnest. In fact, it was Chancellor Kosla who gave us seed funding to start what became the first dedicated phage therapy program in North America in June of 2018. The day that we opened Science Magazine published a commentary where a microbiologist who I don't know said this is a game changer in the field. Uh, we published lots of case reports and case series, and there's been an explosion of phage research globally. Um, our um, um, story at IPATH isn't all rosy, though. We, As I mentioned, we've had um, roughly 2,000 requests for phage therapy since we opened. Um, now, about half of these cases are not, um, are, are cases where phage is not indicated because it's still experimental treatment. So if you have antibiotic options left, the FDA won't approve it. So a phage hunt has been recommended in 407 cases. A phage hunt was initiated in 337 of those because sometimes an isolate couldn't be provided. So if someone has bacterial prostatitis, sometimes it's very hard to get a sample. Um, sometimes the patient died before um, we could even get the phage hunt going. Um, and if, and lytic phages, those are the phage rage kind that you want for treatment, um, have been discovered in 170 of those cases. Um, and then, but there's other problems, regulatory issues, sometimes um, shipping issues. And uh, we've treated 53 patients. Um, so that's about 15% of those that um, we've initiated phage hunts for. So this is not a scalable model. There are lots of different ways that we can overcome these bottlenecks, however, and we're working on those right now. But um, nevertheless, um, there's now phage therapy programs at Baylor, the Mayo Clinic and Yale, and there's um, national programs all over the world, Australia, Canada, 
Belgium, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK now has a program. So phage is all the rage. We have had um, requests for lots of different bacterial species, not just the one that Tom had. Um, and also um, we've begun phage therapy clinical trials. Um, the first um, that, that was uh, supported by the NIH for an intravenous phage therapy trial is actually being led by Dr. Schooley and Dr. Tama from Johns Hopkins through the Antimicrobial Resistance Leadership Group, which is a network of research institutions across the U.S. that had up until this point just been focused on, you know, pushing new antibiotics through the pipeline. This is the first time where the drug is alive. Um, this trial is now in its second uh, phase and it, it began over a year ago. Um, the Economist published an article recently where they um, tracked the number of clinical trials that have begun since um, um, the beginning. Um, and you can see like in 2017 was when Tom's case was, was published and that there's been a, a total explosion since then. So that's what we really need. Um, phage therapy trials are going to be needed so that we can compare phage to antibiotics and that the FDA can then license it alongside antibiotics um, so that we have some options for people that are running out of options. So um, the other thing is that there's been an explosion of phage case reports by year. So um, there's there's just a lot of, of activity in this area. In fact, there's many groups at UCSD that are working on phage research, um, both basic science and applied to phage therapy. Um, and just in case you're interested, the types of infections that we um, have been treating um, about 30% are people with implanted devices. So prosthetic knees, hips, pacemaker lines that get infected. Um, I'm sure there's lots of folks who are listening who have these kinds of devices because when you have any kind of hardware that's put in your body, um, it's very hard for antibiotics to get through um, these um, these kinds of implants develop biofilms. So if you get an infection, it's very hard to treat with antibiotics. We've also had uh, about 17% of people with pulmonary infections. Many of these are cystic fibrosis patients. And we have an, a growing number of people with urinary tract infections. And Dr. Saima Aslam has just been approved um, for a new trial of urinary tract infections that are not responding to antibiotics. So lots of different um, conditions. And before I wrap, I wanted to also point out that although this talk is focused on phage applications to treat multidrug resistant bacterial infections in humans, that phage can actually be applied from a One Health perspective to really combat an antimicrobial resistance from a variety of perspectives. So um, it can be used in biodefense, and that's why the Navy was um, looking at phage in the beginning. Um, people like Rob Knight and Jack Gilbert are interested in phage to be able to groom the microbiome to take out unfriendly bacteria in your gut and your other, and other locations on your body. Um, and the nutrition industry is very interested in this. Phage are being used used um, in food safety to um, decontaminate meat against listeria or to try to, to remove salmonella from um, romaine lettuce. Um, it can be used to disinfect wastewater. It can be used to replace antibiotics in agriculture and aquaculture. It can be used to replace antibiotics in livestock. And it also can be used as a vector to deliver um, cancer therapeutics or vaccines. Mm. And um, the last example I want to give is it can be used as prophylaxis during outbreaks. So one outbreak that we're facing right now in the U.S. is um, one that you might have heard of. It's with extensively drug-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa associated with artificial tears. Um, two companies in India manufacture these um, eye drops. These are not the kind, the over-the-counter kind, the, the kind that are prescribed. Um, and unfortunately, they contaminated um, some of their reagents. And it's led to a multi-state outbreak. Um, either, as of last May, there were 81 cases, 18 states, four deaths, and four people who had their eyebrow uh, balls surgically removed. So very serious. And um, when we heard about this outbreak, Dr. Schooley, um, in his wisdom, thought we have lots of phages against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
So he approached the CDC and said, could we help? And they said, wow, we really need help. And they sent us those bacterial isolates involved in this outbreak. And Dr. David Pride in our iPath lab found phages uh, from leftover wastewater from the COVID surveillance that the university has been doing from the Return to Learn program. And this paper was just published recently showing that jumbo phages that they found, which are as almost as large that you could see them under a light microscope, are active against um, um, this, the, the isolates that are involved in this outbreak. So, so we're very encouraged by this and we're working closely with the CDC to see if we can help with other outbreaks. Um, so the last example that I wanted to give is that the advent of CRISPR-Cas gene editing um, and phage therapy are coming together. Um, the first genetically engineered phage cocktail to be used successfully to treat a human with a drug-resistant bacterial infection was published in May of 2019. This is the case of Isabel, a cystic fibrosis patient who'd had a double lung transplant and whose lungs were being attacked by an intracellular bacterial pathogen called Mycobacterium obsessus that is actually a cousin to tuberculosis. And it's a very tricky pathogen to treat. Um, and when, when her mother heard about Tom's case, she reached out to her doctors and asked if um, Isabel could get phage therapy. And her doctors um, reached out across the pond. Dr. Schooley got involved. And by this time, we knew that there was a, um, a university-based program called the C-Phages program that's headquartered at the University of Pittsburgh, where students do that plaque assay that I showed you earlier in the talk, um, and they isolate phages as part of their undergraduate microbiology classes. So they're learning about like, bacteriology and virology. And if they find a new phage, they get to sequence it, they get to name it, and it goes into a phage library. Well, nobody ever dreamed that these phages had any therapeutic potential and his, until Isabel's case came along. And Dr. Hatfield in his lab found one phage that was actually sourced from a rotting eggplant in South Africa by a student there. Um, it, and that was a perfect phage, but he wanted um, other phages that could go together in a cocktail. Uh, and he didn't find um, uh, the ideal phages. Um, they were the sleepy phages that unfortunately integrate into the bacterial um, DNA and hit the snooze button. So what he did was genetically modify those two phages so that they would be the lytic or phage rage kind of phage that could be used for treatment. And now this, this became the first genetically modified phage cocktail. Luckily, the UK government did not see this as a GMO. They saw, well, you know, you're taking away uh, a gene, you're not adding a gene. And Isabel, who was in hospice at the time, um, actually received phage therapy intravenously based on Tom's protocol and left the hospital within a week. She had an extra three years of life before she succumbed to cystic fibrosis. But in the meantime, she learned how to drive. She worked. We became friends on Facebook and, you know, played silly cat games and things like that. And I miss her terribly. Um, but her case was um, groundbreaking because now we learned that you can actually improve a plant phage lifestyle. And so there's a lot of biotechs that are moving in to this area now because it's much easier to patent um, phage that have been genetically modified. So um, uh, one of the last things I'll say is that um, what we've learned through um, Tom's case and Isabel's case and others is that we really need to build a phage library so that we don't have to go back to sewage or barnyard waste every time a patient has a bacterial infection. If a phage is already characterized in sequence and so we know which phage it goes along best with in a cocktail, we know which antibiotics it, pair, it pairs with to hopefully synergize, um, then we can actually source phages very quickly. So we're building a phage library at IPATH. We're fundraising for this. Um, and um, it's an area that is, is very important because uh, phage and bacteria are co-evolving. And so you need to keep adding to these libraries. And so um, we're, we're very confident that if we have an extensive enough library that we will be able to um, stop those bottlenecks in the pipeline that I showed you earlier. So with that, I'm going to close. Um, Tom and I realized how 
privileged we really were. I mean, what we went through was a terrible ordeal. He had to under and just awful, awful things. But um, but we realized that if we didn't have the resources and the connections and and really the wonderful staff and and faculty and leadership at UCSD Health um, and um, the Department of Medicine in particular that he would have died. And so we decided to write our memoir, uh, The Perfect Predator, so that we would raise awareness of antimicrobial resistance and this hundred year old forgotten cure. And um, and to my um, amazement, this has also encouraged a lot of young people to go into science. Um, on the bottom right hand is, um, is Congressman Morgan Griffith of Virginia, who held up our book in a recent congressional hearing on antimicrobial resistance, where he said this is how he learned about AMR and phage therapy. And um, so even though he uh, uh, his politics are very different from mine, this is definitely a bipartisan issue. And um, it's one that we um, are are hoping that we can make a difference in. So with that, I'll close and see if you have any questions for Tom or I. Um, we also, if you'd like a copy of our book, we can get it at cost. We have to actually buy our own books. Um, if I bring them to the university, I can. Um, it costs 10 bucks. If I have to mail them anywhere in the US, I can do that for $20. So just feel free to email me or put your uh, info in the chat and then we can follow up. Um, so I'll stop there and see what you all think. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, that was fantastic. And uh, a plug for your book. I read it over the holidays and it's a wonderful medical mystery and incredibly inspiring. So strongly recommended for those of you who are interested to gain further insight. So um, anyone who has a question, raise your hand electronically or put a question in the chat. And uh, while we're thinking of our questions, uh, Tom, there you are, Tom. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Um, He's looking pretty good, isn't he? He is. <laughs> In incredibly good, given the, the uh, pictures that you showed. Yes, yes, yes. So um, questions. Yes, uh, Jake Jacoby. Thank you. You can start. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, uh, how do you manage your library? In what format are the files in your library? Are they only... Uh, are they kept in organisms on agar or in broth? How do you ma maintain them? Um, well, I'm not um, totally um, adept in this area, but I know that you can actually, um, you know, spin down the phage and have it like in a small little Epi Eppendorf tube and have it frozen that way. Um, you can even lyophilize phage as well. Um, but generally there, there's, there's, um, you, you can, if you store them in the fridge, they have to be at, I mean, you need to keep them at four degrees Celsius, not room temperature, but generally um, they're pretty stable um, when they're frozen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Gorovich has the next question. Thanks, Stephanie. That was a great presentation. Congratulations on the success, but also for a wonderful uh, presentation for all of us. I was wondering what you would recommend uh, if you were asked by a congressional committee to guide on research, what advice would you give? How would you design an uh, ongoing research project on this? How do you think research should be done on this? Well, um, Dr. Schooley and I both believe that you need to treat phage like a living antibiotic. So it really needs to undergo the clinical trials um, that you would do if you found a, a new molecule. Um, and wanted to develop it into a drug. Um, but because phage are alive, right? I mean, you know, there's a debate as to whether viruses are alive or dead, but but because phage multiply um, inside the body, you might know the dose that you're giving the patient, but you don't know the dose that you're actually receive, the patient is receiving because the phage are gonna multiply as long as the bacteria are there. Mm -hmm. So what you really need to do are pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies um, to be able to um, to track the, those phage where they go so that you can dose up properly. So those kinds of bench to bedside types of studies can be done within the context of clinical trials. Um, and we have cautioned um, biotechs and pharmas not to rush to phase three trials too quickly without these um, 
you know, kinds of translational questions like around the dose, the route of administration, um, uh, without those questions being answered first, um, or else, um, you know, the, the trial might not succeed. Um, but, you know, in terms of antimicrobial resistance in, in general, um, there's a lot of different issues that need to be undertaken, certainly um, in taking on agribusiness um, and having better global surveillance. Um, uh, there are national action plans in most countries for um, tracking antimicrobial resistance, but most of them um, have no accountability. So um, if there's been an increase, um, there's nobody saying, well, you know, what are we going to do about this? Um, so there really needs to be um, a passing of the Pasteur Act, which has got both push and pull incentives um, to keep pharmaceutical industries in this business, but also to look at alternatives to antibiotics like phage. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Who is Zoom iPhone? Can you identify yourself? The, the question is, what is the latest on seeing this story on the big screen or streaming on TV? Well, um, most recently we were on CNN International's Vital Signs with Sanjay Gupta. So um, I can um, put that link in the chat if you um, want to see that. Um, we actually have had Hollywood interest for quite some time now. Um, and it's being pursued by um, a two-time Oscar-winning actress um, who wants to play me. It's a little surreal even saying something like that. <laughs> the screenplay is in its second draft right now, and they're hoping to pitch it to studios, um, you know, within the next couple months. So, you know, Hollywood is a fickle place. Um, there was a writer's strike, and prior to that, there was COVID. And so who knows whether it's ever going to be on the big screen, but these folks seem to be um, very uh, committed to uh, getting it there. So we'll keep you posted. Wonderful. Alison Phillips put in the chat. Um, she read your book last year and highly recommends it as one of the best she's read in a long time. That's and super. It's, it's also being used in a number of classrooms too, public health and virology and microbiology and wonderful. even medicine. Great, great. And Ron Campbell was... Cam Nell was the one who asked the question about whether your story will be on the large screen or on TV. Um, uh, Tom, can you and, and Stephanie tell us a little bit about your the challenges of your recovery after having been in the hospital, basically incapacitated for five months or more? Well, recovery from, uh, I was in the hospital for nine months. Oh, sorry. Okay, nine months. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, just to put that in perspective, had I received phage therapy, I think it could have been out in a couple of weeks, if that. So, you know, rah, rah for phage therapy. But after you've been in the hospital for as long as I had, you uh, become decommissioned, uh, de um, you lose muscle mass completely, decommissioned. And it takes about five times as long to recover as the time you were in the hospital. So you're talking about years of time. I had to learn to, to talk, to walk, to swallow. I mean, everything from the beginning. Um, and, you know, as at my age, now uh, I, I was turned 69 while I was in the hospital. So you know, you age at the same time, which is slows progress. But basically, it's just a matter of exercise daily and keeping after it, good diet. Naturally, you know, you if going through what I did, you get a lot of dings to the body. So I lost part of my pancreas and all of my gallbladder. And I have other issues, which you'd expect from the kind of infection that I had. But I'm so privileged to have had an international response to my illness and uh, family, friends, I can't tell you how important those things are when you're in the hospital for as long as I was, visiting people, uh, having people come in was really important even though I was in a coma. And that is a point that I always try to make. Even though I was in a coma, 
I was able to hear. And it wasn't that I was, you know, processing things in a normal way. If you've read the book, you know that uh, I interpreted things in a very peculiar way. But those interpretations came from things that were going on outside of my body. So, for example, I um, thought that I was being uh, filmed for a documentary on death. And that came about because people were standing over me saying, it's futile, he's dying. And so point being, be kind when you visit someone who's in a coma, don't assume that they are unable to hear you. Excellent, excellent. Um, just to kind of follow up on that, those thoughts uh, further, um, Stephanie and Tom, how has this whole experience changed your 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 relationship and your family? Well, I think that you know it it can't help but bring you even closer, um, and you realize that every day is a gift. Um, you know, one thing that really struck me was that. Um, when my my dad passed away about a year after Tom got out of the hospital and he'd been very healthy and all of a sudden he developed a strange illness and ended up on a ventilator and I flew to Toronto um, to see him and he died in my arms um, and my whole family was there but nobody um, could actually play that role except me and um, it, and if I hadn't gone through what I had with Tom I don't think I I could have done it. Um, and now I realize that when someone decides that they, that to leave their spirit leaves their body in, in your presence, that that's a gift. Um, so I've just, um, I, I guess I feel a lot wiser about the world, but I'm also very humbled um, because so many people that are dying from superbug infections are in lower and middle income countries. And so, um, you know, the fact that we had the resources that we had, um, really mean that, that this is probably the reason we're on the planet. And um, that's why we've decided to make sure that we tell our story and use it as a learning opportunity in many different ways. Um, but our family is is very close. Um, we all had PTSD. Um, Tom had uh, what's called post-ICU syndrome. And I talk about that in the epilogue. Uh, um, we had the family version of that, a PIXF as it's called, and we were all treated for, for that. Um, and many people who watched family in the hospital with COVID or COVID survivors um, really, really related to that aspect of the book. So that's a, it's a real un untold mental health challenge of survivors who have been in comas or on ventilators. Um, Bronwyn Anders uh, asks, uh, very interested in your career from years ago before he learned about your Nile event as it happened, would very much like a signed copy of your book. Oh, he puts the information in chat. So will you be able to capture that, uh, Stephanie? Um, I, I'll, I'll try to write that down. <laughs> Thank you. Or perhaps Bronwyn could just email you with that information. Um, and then... Um, Rena Waldberg to everyone, ask if Lysing's phages can also introduce or trigger disease. In the 70s, when she worked as a clinical lab scientist, she worked in a 400-bed hospital lab. In five years, they had one case of MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Things change quickly, but this certainly has promise for multidrug-resistant infections. So she's just reiterating um, some of the lessons that you observed and learned uh, from your process? Um, well, definitely, if if you don't um, remove um, the endotoxin from a phage preparation, you can actually trigger septic shock. But it's not the phage that's causing that. It's actually the, the bacterial cell wall mm -hmm. that has a toxin in it. And that's seen it with gram-negative bacteria, um, especially. Um, but we haven't seen any negative side effects whatsoever from phage therapy. Um, Tom's white blood count initially rose the first day that we gave it to him, but it went right back down. And when you think that 30 billion phages are estimated to move in and out of our tissues every single day, it's not necessarily a surprise that your body doesn't see phage as, as an invader in the same way that it would as a parasite or a virus, another kind of virus. 
Thank you. Sharon Beckus asked, did this create a financial burden? And was there a GoFundMe page? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, and it turned a, a personal financial burden. Um, the only part that we experienced um, because we had good health insurance through the university was um, when Tom came home, um, I had to have nursing care for him around the clock initially um, and and helpers because, you know, just to um, get him to the toilet or shower, et cetera. Um, and that came out of our pocket. But um, when you think that um, one month in the ICU without any procedures is about half a million dollars, um, this is probably the $10 million man, you know. <laughs> um, Jill, Vam Pola uh, ask, how do we give directly to your research? Um, that's great. Well, gifts can actually um, come to iPath on our website. I'll put that in the chat. We really appreciate it because we have run out of the Chancellor's initial seed funding. We're asking BC Carruthers for additional funding and we'll be hoping to partner with UC Health. Um, and, um, but at this point, I mean, I'm actually doing all my work with iPath and as is Dr. Schooley, I'm totally uncompensated. Um, so uh, we'd appreciate any, any kind of gifts that you, that you have. Um, I, a couple of additional questions I have, if I don't see hands or, or um, chat questions. Um, why um, is the technology sufficiently advanced that you can engineer the phage so you don't have to go searching in nature or are there still barriers to be addressed? Yes, um, so um, I mentioned genetically modified phages, but there are also teams that are working on synthetic phages. So um, for example, there's a Canadian company that I'm aware of that I don't have any business relationship with. They have a yeast-based platform and they say that they can develop phages de novo within 30 days to any bacterial pathogen. Um, and they're, they're trying out their, um, their synthetic phage um, in the poultry industry first before they try with humans. Um, so certainly synthetic or genetically modified phages are going to be held to a higher bar by the FDA, but the FDA is open to it because for reasons that we don't really understand in microbial ecology, there that sometimes we find phage, but that's not the appropriate phage for phage therapy. It's just, it's the sleepy phage that I mentioned earlier. And those are called temperate phages. So they don't kill the bacterial cell. They integrate into the bacterial cell DNA and, and, and go and hit the snooze button is the way I describe it in the book. And they can carry AMR genes and toxin genes. So you really don't want to use them, but they can be um, engineered to be those lytic phage rage kind. Um, and so, um, you know, there are um, diseases that we don't have lytic phage for right now, like um, Lyme disease. We can only seem to find temperate phages. So those those types of diseases where we can only find temperate phages, we are going to either need um, genetically modified or synthetic phage. Okay, great. <clears throat> And um, uh, there was a recent uh, publication in a high impact journal of a new antibiotic that may have activity against Acinator bacteria um, baumannii. Um, and I was wondering your thoughts about that antibiotic. Were you aware of that? Uh, have you been involved in any of that type of research? Yeah, I haven't been involved in that research, but I was I was reading about it. And I was really excited because Acinetobacter bomanii um, is is a very you know serious killer, um, and it's often affecting um, you know people who have been on ventilators and COVID survivors are at high risk of of abomanii, and there haven't been any new antibiotics in the pipeline for a long time. So it's great that there's a new antibiotic discovered, but you know these take ten to fifteen years to make it through the pipeline, and um, so uh, compare that to a phage that takes three weeks to source and to get it sequenced even faster if you have the phage library there. So um, I don't think phage is ever going to replace antibiotics altogether. Um, we've always used phage in concert with antibiotics, but it will mean that you will use less antibiotics if you use phage. So I, I do think that there's a place for both. Great. Thank you. Um, 
Any additional questions? If not, I have one final question. Uh, Stephanie, you were certainly the epitome of uh, the best medical advocate one could have. Uh, granted, supported by a cast of hundreds, potentially uh, uh, internationally, who supported your efforts. Uh, what is the most important lesson you learned regarding being an effective medical advocate for your husband who was gravely ill? Well, I think advocacy is one of the most important lessons of the book. Um, and, um, you know, I was in three different um, health environments, you know, in Egypt and then Germany and then in, in San Diego. And in each, I needed to advocate for him in different ways. Um, and um, I think um, that was something that surprised me um, because, you know, you just think that um, you can play a passive role and that the doctors and the nurses know best and they're going to just do everything. But, you know, we are part of the care team as family members. We know our loved one better than they do. And um, by getting educated about what's going on in terms of their illness and the the clinical signs and the markers of, you know, worsening or imp uh, cases or improvement, um, that helps us um, understand what's going on and it prepares you for, you know, the, the best or the worst. Um, so I think that, um, getting educated and then trying to join rounds, um, now UCSD actually has institutionalized, um, this family led rounds and I've co-authored a couple of papers and book chapters on that from the caregiver's perspective. And other hospitals are thinking of doing it too, because if you're part of rounds, you actually are learning what's going on because rounds are how medical residents and fellows are learning. And you as kind of the caregiver can get educated at the same time. Wonderful. Uh, something came to mind as you were recounting your experiences. Um, you mentioned in the book that you interacted with your travel insurance company extensively, especially in the um, trip to Germany and then to the United States. Were there any lessons you learned in dealing with a gravely ill spouse uh, and travel insurance? Yeah, well, the first thing that I would say um, is that when you get travel insurance, get the kind that includes medevac. Um, and if you're, um, and medevac means medical med evacuation, right. correct? That's, that's right. So air ambulance, um, it turns out that through UC, um, even if you're emeritus or even if you're going on holiday and not a business trip, you can purchase, um, travel insurance much cheaper than you can. If you, um, if you go to uh, any, any company and it will cover, um, medevac which is really what you definitely need um and the other thing is that um the way at least the the travel insurance company worked when when i dealt with them when tom was ill is that we, we had to prove that he needed a higher level of care and they the the one woman who i spoke to basically coached me on what information she would need to determine that he needed a higher level of care um whether it was pain not being addressed whether it was um his um, diabetes not being managed um those kinds of things and she had me take photographs and um so i did all of those things because um that's what it took um she she woke up the medical director in the middle of the night to say this guy needs to get out of here um and fast or he's gonna die so um it was it was a, a real education <laughs> So first of all, to have travel insurance and B, to make sure it has medical evacuation options if needed. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and the, the UC travel insurance can be purchased through UCOP, through the Office of the President. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to join with uh, some of the comments in the chat saying both of you are incredibly inspiring and um, we thank you very much for everything you've done to help others as a result of your uh, incredible experience. Well, um, it's just been a pleasure and um, I, I, it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, Melody in particular uh, has worked with Tom for, for years. And so I just put my email address in there in case anybody had any additional questions or if you wanted to follow up with me about a book or anything else. Um, we're about to go to Chile for two weeks. We leave on Friday. The Chilean Senate invited me to speak at Congreso Futuro about phage therapy. So 
we're excited. Um, I always get nervous about taking Tom with me to these exotic <laughs> places, but he says he, he can't stop living. Wonderful. Well, safe travels. 